From training camp. And if you want a job, man, you got to work hard. To the preseason. Scampers down to the 32-yard line. Through the playoffs. He's in! Touchdown! And into the offseason. To be able to get the best players, it's a critical time for us. It's always Colts season. This is Colts Corner with Kevin Bowen. Week three, Colts and Bears coming up Sunday, 1 o'clock. Andrew Catalan. Tiki Barber, Devin McCourty, same crew as week one here for the Colts. And as we talk on this Wednesday afternoon, I think still a slight favorite. I'll double check here. One and a half, I believe, is last I saw at one here. Okay. Uh, One point favorite, the Colts in week three. So a lot to get to Bears-wise and Eddie Garrison as we talk on this Wednesday. We certainly have news that, boy, I've never uh, talked about in my, I guess, in the five-year era of this man being in a Colts uniform. That is no DeForest Buckner. Um, you and I did the indispensable Colts list right before the start of the season. I had him third on my list. Life without a man, it is, um, it'll be a test. You know, certainly he's a very unique three down player. Um, obviously, with him going on IR, he's out at least four weeks. So that'll be Bears, Steelers at. Jags and at Titans, we'll see when he returns. You know, Josh Downs, of course, you know, that's been a little bit longer, about a month and a half when it's all said and done for him. Um, so, yeah, it, it, it's a huge, huge loss. And I think on paper is where some people might, you know, if they were born on Mars and they looked at the Colts and they somehow was were born on Mars but understood how the draft works and how the NFL works, they would look at the depth and be like, wait a minute, you have all these draft picks behind him. That shouldn't be too big of a loss. It's kind of wild when you think of the five names right behind Buckner. And again, not in this order necessarily, but Taven Bryan, Raekwon Davis, Dio Dengbo, Tyquan Lewis can slide inside, uh, Adetama uh, Adabare. And we're talking about five dudes all drafted in the first four rounds. Four of them drafted in rounds one or two. So again, on paper, it's like, wait a minute, you know, here's all this depth and everything, but certainly you watch the first two weeks and you would be foolish to call it that, but nonetheless, huge loss. And by the way, good afternoon to you. Good afternoon. Happy birthday. Happy, thank you. Happy birthday. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, 35, man. 35? Mm-hmm. Is this where you make like a run for president joke? No. no. Found out today that the average life expectancy of males is around 72. So um, by Jake Query's definition, you are approaching middle-aged. Okay. Well, thank you, Jake, for that. That sounds like a very Jake-like thing. Yeah, I feel old. Do you? I think. In some ways, I do. Some ways, I don't. Like when you wake up in the morning after yeah, golfing. It's certainly. Wow. Gosh. Yeah. That. Yeah. That'd be nice. Uh, gray hair. Uh, hair loss in general. Uh, yeah. Aching body. So on today's show with Jake on Wednesday, mm-hmm. we were talking about DeForest Buckner and the injury of, because of him being announced uh, Tuesday afternoon. Yeah. Going on injured reserve. Um, Shane Steichen today. No timeline. Um, in terms of a return for Buckner, so it could be four weeks, could be six weeks. Who knows? It could be never. Um, for the season, which. I uh, probably, that sounds depressing. I know, but I just got to throw it out there, you know, because sometimes sure. things like that happen. Um, and I was like, you look at this Colts defense on player on paper. Leading up to this game, if he was healthy, you know, Matt Eberflus looks at him and like, okay, uh, I Luke Getzey, he's not there anymore. Who's their new OC? Uh, the dude from Seattle, uh, Waldron. Shane, Shane, Waldron. Shane Waldron. Okay, Waldron, right? Shane Waldron meets with Matt Eberflus. They're going over the offensive game plan. And looking at the Colts' defense, okay, we have to eliminate, we've got to neutralize this guy. That's to force Buckner. You remove Buckner, it's like, who's that guy now? Who, who are you looking at? And like, okay, we have to make sure this guy does not beat us. Well, that's a good question. Um, I don't think anyone jumps off the page would be my easy answer. Um, you know, I think continuing to get traffic in front of EJ Speed and Zaire Franklin. I think teams have done a really nice job of that here early in the season. Um, the question for Matt Eberflus is probably more about his own team right now, right? especially his own offense, and we'll get to that, I guess, more Bears notes-wise, but I just think one thing to wrap up s- specifically on Buckner, Eddie, is he's just a three-down talent at defensive tackle. And I mean, there's is there another Colt player that hasn't missed a game in five years? I mean, I'm guessing outside of Luke Rhodes, the answer is probably no, right? Kenny? No, Kenny definitely has missed some games between now and, yeah, because Kenny missed the end of that one season. I missed, like, the final month one year. It, it just, we haven't seen this. Yeah, well, mm-hmm. the only, I mean, we've obviously seen him on pitch counts, but 
just again, what does life look like him? You know, it, it's curiosity, and it's a different type of curiosity than Anthony Richardson curiosity. It's more of the other side of it. So, yeah, obviously huge, huge loss. That is the biggest injury news of the week. It does sound like Josh Downs is going to give it a go. Um, that is the plan as we sit here Wednesday afternoon for him to practice, practice fully all week for a second straight week. Practice. Uh, this will be his first week fully. And then um, I think the other thing with Downs is just how much can he help out a passing offense that has been very feast or famine, certainly much more famine in week two. Um, I think a lot of people know what I think of Downs. I just think he's such a reliable, consistent guy, and he helps you out in an area of the field where Anthony Richardson has struggled. So uh, that would obviously... Be something to watch. Julian Blackman was back to practice today. That's a good sign. I didn't even see him in a red jersey when I was out there. You know, right shoulder. I think sometimes you see guys in the limited contact jerseys. Um, Latu Latu did not practice. I'm not sure about Quiddy Pay. You asked me that earlier. Um, they did bring up Jannard Avery, for mm-hmm. what it's worth, off the practice squad to the active roster. That was the permanent move they made, uh, or I should say the roster move they made with Buckner going to IR. Um, you know, does that mean you have, you know, Dio was moving inside, or Taekwon's moving more inside, probably Dio, um, than Taekwon. Is that some of that? Is it for Latu insurance? You know, those would be things to watch as the week moves along. I feel like that covers everything injury-wise. Eddie, should we transition to other things we've learned this week? Yeah, that is correct. So on uh, Monday in our recap pod, we had a lot of questions about the lack of utilization for Jonathan Taylor in Mm -hmm. the fourth quarter. Right. So we'll start there first and foremost because that was the big question after that game on Sunday and Shane Steichen met with you and the rest of the media on Monday correct you after the pod correct yeah. and then Jim Bob Cooter uh, the offensive coordinator met with you and the rest of the media on Tuesday now what was the overall takeaway from both of those conversations as to why Jonathan Taylor was not on the field yeah the takeaway was we needed to get Trey Sermon reps and why my thought, why? Um, you could use an expletive uh, associated with why as well. WTF? You know? uh, sure, that's very accurate. I like that one gift. The guy, he's got the blonde hair. He's kind of doing that, um, mouthing it. Uh, that's a gift that I like to use. Yeah, I, I don't. <laughs> I walk away more confused than I was Monday on the pod. Mm-hmm. In all honesty, you know, I, I I literally walk away more confused. I don't I don't get it. Trey Sermon is not a pass catcher whatsoever. Eddie, they targeted him six times last year. He dropped three of them. <laughs> he wasn't that guy at Oklahoma. He wasn't that guy at Ohio State. He runs four six in the forty. If you watch, it's not like he stayed in and it was like a blocker a whole lot in the fourth quarter either. He was like actually going out on routes. Um, makes no sense to me. I just added confusion. If you really want to get technical, Tyler Goodson is probably more the pass catcher. Um, so. Yeah, it, it, I, I don't know. I don't know, man. It, uh, It's weird. It's odd. I'll continue to re- reiterate what I did. On Monday's podcast, and I have the bigger issue is third and one. Like, if I am going to make a list of reasons why the Colts lost the game, I don't think keeping Jonathan Taylor on the bench for the entire fourth quarter is on the you know first three or four reasons why you lost. But still, it's your best playmaker on the bench for an entire quarter in a two-score game. Like, a two-score game in a quarter – is not, you know, game over, start, you know, boarding the plane back to Indy. Um, so I understand why people have questions about it, and we've seen this before. So um, my question would be this, Eddie. What is Shane Stecken not telling us? Did you just get an email? I did. Uh, did Taylor get benched because of the fourth and four drop? Because of the fumble on the first play of that drive? Here's the thing that I go back to when you bring those plays up. Even if he does catch it on whatever that third down, there was that one too, the 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 pass yeah, out in the mm-hmm, flat, right, and the fourth down that you just alluded to there, he's not getting the first down even if he does catch fair, it. Fair. So like, th- that's all a moot point to me. It's like even if the guy's not gonna get the first down, there's no point in bitching him. I think you can say this about Jonathan Taylor in the past game. Inconsistencies, inconsistencies as a blocker and as a pass catcher, but at the same time, there are moments and. I believe it was the first play of that drive where he does catch and run it for 19 yards. Mm-hmm. Please show me the Trey Sermon highlight reel of him as a pass catcher. Yeah. So again, I, I you know what are you not telling us? Is this another instance of Shane Steichen, the play caller, versus the head coach? You know, the head coach after a handful of plays is probably like, 
Uh, hello, gets on the headset. What are we doing here? Is Taylor hurt? Did no one tell me this? And not to mention, like, you're in the fourth quarter and you're trailing. Like, you don't punish a player in that situation if, if I'm a head coach. Like, I do it later. I do that, whether that's in practice, I do that the next week. I'm not doing it in a time where I need him on the field. And, you know, you go back to week one, two, Taylor played 43 or 45 snaps. Yes. So when you hear this, you know, we don't want to play him all these snaps or whatever, or, you know, I asked Shane today, hey, do you feel like you have a third down back? Oh, we feel good about all the third down back or all, all the backs. Well, it's just odd. It, it, it's just very odd how Taylor did not play a snap. And again, I went back and watched all the fourth quarter. and You good there? I still think, yeah, I had a big hiccup. Uh, I still think you have an ability to sprinkle him in and honestly sprinkle a touch or two in. Yeah. I mean, you're down two scores. And I get the first drive was the three play drive that ended in the pick in Pittman's direction. But still, um, I mean, hell, you ran it on what? That third and goal from the 10 or something like that? The third and you ran a draw with Sermon. That was, uh, was that the third and 10 right before yeah, the they first touchdown? Became fourth and six. And then Nelson gets the false start coming out of the timeout. And then Richardson, Richardson has the yeah. unbelievable play to get the first down there. So, yeah, uh, weird. Taylor's practicing. For those curious today on if he'll show up on the injury report. So there you go. Um, what else from Monday should we get to? Something we didn't bring up on Monday. Um, I want to stick with this for really one quick second. Did you see the comments made by Jonathan Taylor after the game? Um, when it comes yeah, it's to, about practice, right? Yeah, and the urgency. Like He seemed pretty amped up about that. It was something that wasn't very Taylor-like of his cool, calm, collective manner. It was something about, we got to change this up practice. We got to have more urgency in practice. Like This is where it starts. And like it was something that was like that's a little bit odd to me with the tone that he was speaking with because it was very unlike him. Yeah, I don't, I don't know if I'm going to read too much into that. To be honest with you, um, I don't know. To me, at times, I just think that can be kind of a cop out answer after a game. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, obviously, it's a very specific thing that he does mention. So, um, I don't know. I, I I understand you're bringing it up. Totally get that. But I'm probably not one that's going to harp on that like too, too much there uh, in that end. Uh, the other thing would be the defense. And you talked with Gus Bradley yesterday. Um, and I listened to a little bit of it. Seemed like he was starting to feel the pressure a little bit or is feeling the pressure, whether that's internally or I would externally. Agree. Yeah, I would agree on that. Um, yeah, Gus, I think, felt the need to discuss and felt the need to open up a little bit about it. Um, you know, basically, he doesn't feel like playing too much depth is the issue. Um, he spoke, I would say, pretty highly of guys like Taven Bryan and Atatami Adabare. Some people are frustrated with you know, how much they're playing. Um, I understand that. But again, he doesn't feel like that's a depth. I asked him if he feels like schematically they need to evolve. Um, at, he went kind of the reverse. He goes, at times, I feel like we got too cute on Sunday. I mentioned like the five man fronts. And, um, you know, some people would say, well, when you go five man front, it makes it easy for the opponent to block it up because they know exactly, you know, who's coming there. Um, it, it, I walked away from that thinking you're going to get simpler. That's what you're going to get. You're going to get, hey, we need to play fast. Hey, the linebackers are playing slow because we're overcomplicating things. That's what I read from Gus. Again, we're two games into the season. For what it's worth, they have blitzed a little bit more than they usually do. They still are playing a ton of cover three. I think the most in the league. So, um, again, I, I don't know if I totally agree with the, uh, you know, at this point, you know, we're being too cute with it there. Um, I was, yeah, the too cute comment caught me off guard. Right, and again, I, I, I put like, an article form, so there's more context around it. I, you know, I do think his answer was maybe specifically to the Green Bay game. On 1075thefan.com, right? Thank you, I appreciate that. Uh, versus, like, you know, schematically as a whole. Um, but, you know, I, I think at times people found it odd, like how much I was intrigued by, oh, Nick Cross and Julian Blackman might mix and match free safety and strong safety. And people were like, wow, Kevin really cares about that. And I'm like, well, yeah, because this defense usually doesn't do anything of note from a disguise, from a different standpoint, you know, those sorts of chess, you know, piece items there. Um, I think I'm just reminded as the week moves along, just the domino effect of getting gashed on the run. Um, I think I looked it up the other day. I believe it's since 1978. No team in the NFL has allowed more rushing yards in the first two weeks to start a season than the Colts have. And Eddie, if you look at it, what does that mean? Well, you're 29th on third down. You're 29th in quarterback rating allowed. You have just one takeaway. And that's against 
you know, obviously, Isaiah Franklin stripping Josh Jacobs, and you're dead last in the NFL with passes broken up. And all of this just goes in hand because when you can't stop the run, people get third and manageables, their quarterbacks are put in more of efficient situations. Again, you don't have a ton of third and longs to where all of a sudden you're in these turnover-prone moments. Um, and obviously they don't feel the need, A, to throw it, and B, to put them into stressful passing situations so you aren't able to get your hands on those sorts of balls. So, um, yeah, I, I, I the further you get away from it, it's like, damn, Nick Cross is leading the league in the, he's leading the league in tackles. Mm-hmm. Well, if you look at that list, it's like all linebackers. <laughs> And then Nick Cross. Yeah. It's just a wild list of like the top 10, top 20 guys that are on that there. So, um, yeah, it's got to change. And the good news is the ultimate slump buster, I guess, is walking into your building. And that is Chicago Bears team that are right now, they're totally inept offensively. Uh, they can't protect Caleb Williams and they can't run it. I think I saw DeAndre Swift leads the league in tackles for losses against running backs, like stuff plays, zero or negative yards. Mm-hmm. Um, so that would be the good news on that end. But again, you're dealing with life without Buckner. Um, how do you fix it? You mentioned fixing it. What would be your course of action as to how you would fix the struggles defending the run? Well, I think specifically for this week, to me it is load the box, and it is remember the Titans, you blitz all night. I mean, did you watch Sunday Night Football? That offensive line struggled. Uh, struggled. Is putting it lightly. Thank you. They're asking for Matt Pryor in Chicago. <laughs> they literally want Matt Pryor to start. I mean, that's like the, where they're at. So, um, you know, I think what we're going to get is we're going to get a simpler, you know, look front seven wise. Um, I think you have to find the happy medium between wanting your defensive linemen to get upfield. You know, that's a big emphasis in this scheme. Yep. You know, get upfield, get upfield, get upfield. Well, I think Green Bay especially took advantage of that. Yeah. They got on the perimeter. They, I mean, there's times where like running back gets the ball, and it's like there's two defensive linemen already behind the running back because they're so far upfield. Then you know the offensive lineman just gives them a little push, and then they're able to get the second level, and then Franklin and you know EJ Speed get washed up big time. Um, so you know, to me, I think you fi- got to find a little bit of a balance there. I, I am heavy in loading the box, and then when those passing situations around, uh, you have to blitz. You have to. I mean, if you look at Williams' stats from Sunday night. I mean, just two totally different quarterbacks versus the Blitz um, and, and without it. And I keep on coming back to, I think, what is uber frustrating about the run at defense effort in the first two weeks, Eddie, is when everyone in each building knew you were going to run it is when Houston and Green Bay were most effective. Yep. Everybody knew in the fourth quarter you were going to run it of week one. Yeah. And that was Joe Mixon's best quarter and Houston's best quarter. Mm-hmm. Then fast forward to quarter number one in week two. Everybody knows Green Bay's running it out of the gate. Yeah. Of course they are. <laughs> they don't want Malik Willis throwing the football. I think Malik Willis had like one pass pass the line of scrimmage in the first quarter. Mm-hmm. And look what they do. They just gash you like no other. Yeah. So I think that is what is, again, adding, you know, pouring the salt. Uh, not doing the little, you know, on the canister, canister of the salt, you can do like the big pour, the little pour. Mm-hmm. We're not talking the little pour. Yeah, I know what we're, we're talking about. We're doing the big pour into the wound there from the salt meeting it. So... Um, you know, the defense needs a wake-up call, but it's also now life without their best player. You know, it's just, it, it's kind of an odd time. And then you look at the opponent, and you think, okay, here is a slump buster. You know, walking into your building, uh, how much can you take advantage of it? Um, I'd add one more thing to Shane Steichen mentioned, you know, probably the most animated he was in the press conference today was like, and I think it was the message he told his team, hey, you know, two-game losing streaks happen. Yeah, and obviously they do. You know, he he brought up like, hey, week eight, week nine, that can happen. The problem is, is you're not sitting there at five and three when the losing streak happens. You know, you don't mm-hmm. have all of this goodwill either. You know, bought up or you haven't even won a game. So I think that, and you throw the Buckner injury on top of it, and then you throw the run defense on top of it. Now it's like. You know, I say load the box. Well, you know, if you're going to load the box, that means your back end's a little bit more susceptible. So if all of a sudden you don't run it or they play action you to death, then how does your secondary hold up? Yeah. And you know Richardson is going to be a volatile quarterback. So that's where I do think it is a little different than the week eight, week nine sort of losing streak. Certainly 15 chances. That would be a glass half full look at it. But at the same time, 
Um, there are reasons where, you know, if you would have told me they're one and one without Buckner for a month plus, my tune probably changes a little bit here in how this is viewed. So um, I feel like that covers pretty much everything, Eddie, from a what we learned this week. Um, should we go to Twitter questions? Um, before we do that, we've got to preview the opponent, Kevin. Oh, thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, you've already kind of hinted at it a little bit in terms of the Chicago Bears, but in terms of their numbers, they're one and one because of Will Levis. Um, I'll just put it that way. But as a team, they've struggled offensively. They are uh, they've averaged the fewest passing yards per game, ninety nine. Kevin, ninety nine passing yards a game through two weeks. No touchdowns, and yeah, hasn't thrown two hundred yards. Right. That is yep. correct. And then in terms of their rushing attack, they're averaging about 77 per game if my uh, memory serves correctly. And that's not even the worst. It's like fifth or sixth worst. Um, their offensive line has struggled. Defensively, they have been stout through two weeks, uh, haven't, haven't given up a lot of explosive plays. And you can say what you want about Tennessee in week number one, but when you look at Houston in week number two, they didn't really get anything going outside of Nico Collins and um, C.J. Stroud. Sure. But sure. Uh, overall, your thoughts about Chicago that you haven't touched on already? Well, really good defense, I think, especially in the secondary. Um, offensively, again, they have had massive struggles early in the season. Um, Matt Eberflus, I think, has evolved a bit defensively. He certainly does not have a fan in Zaire Franklin. I can assure you of that. So I think this one probably a little bit more circled on the Zaire Franklin calendar here on the schedule um and like i said on monday that there's gonna be a ton of orange in that building a mm-hmm. ton of orange in that building you look at the secondary ticket market it is pretty through the roof here um for a week three matchup so um will it be orange or will it be navy blue or well, whatever that color yeah, is i don't know i guess navy blue is a little different than colts blue but you cannot let williams get an ounce of comfort malik willis got that he got comfortable, and that can't happen. You, you have got to make Caleb, because Caleb Williams, I'd argue, he's got more recent scar tissue than Malik Willis. Malik Willis hadn't been in an NFL game in, what, two years, really, of note. You know, that's different. than I mean, Caleb Williams got absolutely pummeled on Sunday Night Football. Pummeled. If you're able to do that early on. Oh, yeah. It's a here-we-go-again sort of feel to it there. Um, and I, I think, I'll go back to it. I'll be curious to see if the Colts open up with tempo. and. If they take the ball early on as well, I think that is something that you could see as well. So um, that's probably, you know, where it is kind of for me. Colts, Bears, again, it would be the second 0-3 start in the last 25 years. Wow. Um, And you've got two home games close out the month, and then you got four or five on the road. You know, weirdly, you've still yet to win a full Anthony Richardson start. Yeah, you know, that's just kind of a little oddity to it. Now, obviously, he played very well, and you got leads in the Houston and Tennessee games last year when he exited. Uh, but that's kind of a little oddity with that. Uh, and we'll see about Matt Gay. You know, where is he at from a long distance standpoint? Cairo Santos made a couple big kicks down in Houston. Mm-hmm. Um, so will that be something that in a low scoring game you have to acknowledge for? A couple players to highlight for Chicago. Obviously, the receivers. DJ Moore leads them, eighty nine receiving yards on eighteen targets, eleven receptions. T.J. Edwards is their leading tackler. He's a linebacker, 23 total tackles. Uh, Jaquan Brisker is a really, really good safety in the NFL um, from Penn State. And then the other linebacker, Tremaine Edmonds, uh, also pretty good. In terms of their secondary, uh, Jalen Johnson, lockdown corner. That's the third straight lockdown corner that Michael Pittman Jr. will have to face Derek Stingley week number one. Jair Alexander week number two. So if you are a person that likes to, to bet in a state that is legal, <laughs> um, I would, I would examine uh, Josh Downs and Alec Pierce props because I would have to side with them being the focal point of the passing attack with Jalen Johnson probably being the corner that will shadow Michael Pittman Jr. all over the field. Yes, yeah, stingy secondary to say the least. Um, and again, I I've been pretty impressed by their defense. Granted, Will Levis is Will Levis, but still, C.J. Stroud to me is in a different. Uh, category. Unless you got anything else, Eddie, I know we got a good amount of Twitter questions, so let's hop in to those. 11 in total, Kevin. We will start with Brett. If they don't trust Jonathan Taylor in critical situations that include passing downs, then why did they pay him the way that they did? It's one thing to overpay a good player. It's another to do so and then not use him. Well, I, I'll go here. I don't think 
Jonathan Taylor as an inconsistent pass catcher is new news. I mean, I remember we had this conversation, I mean, hell, probably exactly 12 months ago, Eddie. You know, Alvin Kamara and Christian McCaffrey are at that level. We had it Monday. For a reason, yeah. We, we, we had a Monday. So I still think Jonathan Taylor was worth that, three years and $42 million. I still think you're in a position of a football team that, A, where else are you going to spend the money? And I know that's a polarizing topic, but seriously. Uh, and Anthony Richardson needed that. I, I probably have more of a question of, like, what was the whole third down back thing this offseason? You know, if you look at Shane Second's history, I mean, Kenneth Gainwell was a bit of that in Philly. Uh, if certainly you go back to the Chargers, and at one point Austin Eckler was definitely that before he grew into even more. Um, you know, it, I mean, the Evan Hall, Tyler Goodson battle, that was like a pre training camp question I had of like, are they going there? Um, I, do they want to have a third down back? And why did Taylor play 43 or 45 snaps week one and then get, you know, really shunned to the bench week two? Because if you look at it, Taylor was playing, I mean, through the first three quarters on Sunday. He had played, I would guess, over 90% of the snaps. Yeah, I think there might have been one or two Trey Sermon snaps, but yeah. that was it. So, yeah. I, I, yeah. But, you know, you, you, three years and $42 million for a home run hitter who's a really durable guy in first and second down, who's a chunk runner with a rookie contract quarterback when you're void of major skill talent at receiver and tight end. I'm still fine with that, even if he's not going to be this, you know, again, McCaffrey Camara type of talent for you. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see how they do against the Bears defense because they've been pretty good against the run. Um, Tony Pollard did get them pretty well. I think he was close to 100 yards in week one, but that was a large part because of game script. Zach is up next. How do we reconcile Chris Ballard's lack of investment this offseason in the secondary when the front seven has been so putrid? Secondary has been good, but I wonder if we'd be more bullish on the secondary if we could stop the run and rush the passer. You earn the right to rush the passer, right? Yeah. What Gus Bradley said on Tuesday. Um, Malik Willis and C.J. Stroud are 36 of 46 against the Colts. I would say this. Ballard's belief has failed so far, and his lack of belief hasn't done anything. I mean, the secondary's done nothing. I mean, what I say earlier this week, two two hands on balls. Uh Uh-huh. I mean, the fewest in the NFL. Um, You know, he... And he said this. I mean, he, he put more pressure on the front and obviously invested more in the front. And the thought there is you're obviously taking something off the secondary's plate there with that. And I mean, hell, if you look at the upcoming quarterbacks, like, <laughs> on paper, I mean, you've lost two of your top five quarterbacks you were supposed to play in Jordan Love and Tua. Tua going on IR includes the Colts game. So it now, does? Yeah, that's the fourth game. So now, Tough. if you look at it, it is... Caleb Williams, Justin Fields, Trevor Lawrence, Will Levis, Skylar Thompson, slash Scoop Huntley. Those are the next. That's you know, Pro Bowl quarterback, Snoop Huntley. Hamley, correct. As with Gardner Minshew, too. Um, so, yeah, I, I I guess Zach, to answer it, again, the core belief is letting you down majorly, and the lack of belief, I would say, when asked to do things, hasn't done it. But I guess they really haven't been immensely tested. Granted, I thought Houston tested them for you know a couple quarters. Now, I want a clarification on the two thing. They have a bye week between New England and the Colts. Yeah, so yeah, that's games, not weeks. Okay. Yep. Just wanted to clarify there. Just wanted to make sure. Because I, I know they say he's out four weeks, but I didn't know if that meant four games yeah. or if it meant four weeks four in general. Four games on the IR to return. Cody asks, if you really think about it, Anthony Richardson has never really developed his pass game as a pocket passer in college. Essentially, he is learning all the new aspects in the passing game. Not shocked at all that there are growing pains. Your thoughts? Yeah. I, it, honestly, I would say the shocking thing for me exiting the first two weeks of the season, I thought Shane Steichen would be more run heavy with Richardson. I thought you'd have more design runs, more RPOs, more zone reads. There's been, a, I would say, a good amount of more drop back passing than I thought. I'm, and I'm, lack, I'm surprised at the lack of like up-tempo Two-minute offense or yeah, four-minute. Yeah, like, yeah, which, I mean, the time of possession. You know, those quick huddles or whatever. I think I looked it up. Of the last 15 years, the time of possession in these two games would be the second and third fewest. They, what, had 19 whatever in, in Green Bay and 20 on the dot say, and against Houston? They're both very, very close. Yeah, 19 and 20. So, yeah, for the franchise in the last 15 years, it's the thec- second and third fewest. And if you look at it, I asked Shane this question today. You look like the last 
again, of those 15 years, the 20 games played of the fewest time of possession, I think they've lost like 19 to 20. So it is a stat that correlates big time to wins and losses. I'm not married to it, but certainly it has some evidence on that end. Kevin, you know our listeners are very dedicated, right? Yes. Oh, extremely. Loyal uh, as loyal can be. Well, Chris is underneath that umbrella, and that's for sure, because Chris states that I had to reactivate my Twitter for this one. <laughs> Damn, how the hell do you remember your password? That's, that's always impressive. my issues. I hope they have like a notepad on like their phone, whether that's on uh, Apple. I've been telling myself I do that for a dozen years, and I still haven't. I just forget the password and try to pray that. Well... My right email is hooked up to it. You better uh, start doing that because uh, you're getting older, Kevin. I know. That's a great point. Uh, on a scale from 1 to 10, how afraid are you after losing DeForest Buckner, Juju Brents, and Julian Blackman? Are we as bad as we look or were expectations too high? Now, the good news there for Chris is that Julian Blackman is back, so that's promising. Yeah, I would... Um You know, Blackman was, what, fourth of my indispensable list? You know, Buckner was three. Um, yeah, what did Vegas have? Vegas had the over-under of eight and a half wins. Yes. Yeah, I was more of a hovering around double digits. I, I, I kind of ended on that 9-10 threshold. Um, I, I obviously did not see that run defense coming at all. I mean, at all. Mm-hmm. Um, so the Buckner out a month plus has me kind of like rethinking some things. Um, but like if you are literally going to say, hey, the trench play defensively is not going to show up, now you're exposing your secondary. I went through all those stats earlier. Now you're not forcing turnovers. Now you're unable to get off the field. Now your offense is only on the field for a third of the game. Like, you know, all of that just starts to add up and there's just a massive domino effect off of that. So I tend to think, this is still a team that can get some of this figured out, but I walk away from the first 120 minutes of football, and the one and one record has me much more alarmed than if you would have told me they they were, excuse me, the 0 two record. I thought they'd be one and one. The how they've looked in the 120 minutes to me might be more alarming than the 0 two record itself. Mm-hmm. If that makes sense, it's exactly what I said after the week one loss, and that's kind of connected to Daniel's question here, Kevin. Nice job on segueing. But week two was like, that was like, damn. Yeah. I mean, that, I mean, that opened up a little bit more for me of like, shit, that was like week Kevin, one. Kevin, it's a family program. Sorry. That's just how bad it was. Week one, I mean, <laughs> played out about how I thought, minus the mix and stuff. You know, yeah. minus the full board mix. And I mean, the first half, I think I tweeted out at halftime about what I thought. You know, pass rush got going. Richardson, you know, created some big plays, but, you know, a little bit inconsistent, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but week two was just, yeah. And, you know, we'll see how the depth gets tested now. I know you're incredibly prepared for each and one of these podcasts, like you are for each and one of every shows that you do on uh, 107.5 The Fan with Andy Sweeney, the wake-up call, by the way, from uh, 7 to 10 a.m. Eastern time. Because uh, Daniel brings up the record point, and he said, hey, Kevin, if you told me a month ago that the Colts would go 0-2 to start, I would not be surprised. But the context behind it is much worse with how bad they've actually played. So wouldn't that change your prediction for the overall win-loss record based off how the season has started? Yeah, yeah. I mean, part of me would like to do that. I'm not a big change-the-record prediction guy, but I do feel a bit foolish like trying to double down on it. It is a must, a must to get to 2-2 two and two by the end of the month because you got 4-5 or five on the road. And, like, is Minnesota good? Minnesota was that weird game that fell in like a difficult stretch where it was like, oh yeah, you know, that'll be a game that you go on the road and get a road win. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, it feels messy. And like this time last year, you know, there was the thought of, hey, you'll get Taylor eventually. Yeah. You know, the, there really isn't that, that guy, I guess. I mean, uh, it, just more reps for Richardson, I, I would suppose, right? Well, that, yeah. And I, I mean, is Josh Downs that, um, like spoiler, I will pick the Colts to win on Sunday. In doing a little straw poll in the media room today, there are not a lot of people confident in that. Um, I think Josh Downs matters a whole lot. That and speaks so, more towards the Colts than it does the Bears, I would assume, right? Yeah, I think so. But I mean, I don't think people give the Bears defense a lot of credit, but still, um, yeah, it is a. It, if you were going to say, Kevin, you have to either pick or you're like, I'm not one that thinks I need to change my record prediction in the month of September. 
But if you were like, no, 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 you, you, you have to. Well, certainly I'd go down mm-hmm. on that win list. Um, I still think you can get some of these things turned around. I don't see. I mean, I don't see horrific run defense for the whole year. Um, I see the pass catchers. I think catching the football at least. You know, if you want to be glass half full, like at least A.D. Mitchell's getting open. Mm-hmm. Uh, He's been one of the best receivers in the league at getting open, actually. So, and again, the return of Josh Downs, I do think, is a huge part in some of this. I think the Taylor-Richardson dynamic, when you get into normal game flow, will be something you can lean on. We haven't really seen that yet. Um, so, yeah, that's I, I guess that's where I'm at. I think the offense will start to change when Taylor finally pops a big one. I think that'll really get him going a little bit. Yeah, you see, he had the what? He had the one twenty nine yarder. Was that it against Green Bay? That was his last touch. Yeah, uh, I think he had a one yard gain right before that because I I went back and watched all that. See oh if he got yeah, hurt or anything and yeah, but yeah, that was yeah second to last touch. Blopa is a frequent listener and a frequent question asker. Blopa, hey guys, the beginning of the season has been disappointing because the offense has been inconsistent, as is logical when you have a quarterback with less than twenty games since college. The scapegoat is the defense because the fans and media asked in preseason to reinforce the perimeter, and the only thing that reinforced was against the run a weak point in these two games. The truth is that it seems unfair to me that the defense is attacked when it has been the one that has maintained some possibility of winning. In the first game, they had they held three quarters of the game in 15 points. In the last one, 16 points in total. In the second half, they received only six points and re- returned the ball to the offense for one last attempt. Yeah, blow pie. I, it, it, it's a fair point. Um, you're bringing back 11 starters on that side of the ball. It's the same coordinator. Mm-hmm. You took the first defensive player in the draft. Mm-hmm. The bar is just higher. Like when you have that sort of retention, multi-year sort of retention. I mean, think about how many guys will be out there on Sunday, Eddie, that Matt Eberflus coached. I mean, a good amount. Kenny Moore, Blackman. I mean, Kenny Moore, Blackman, certainly both linebackers. Grover. You know, Grover up front. Um, you know, I guess Buckner out. A, that's a touchy subject with the two linebackers there. Well, Kevin. yes, especially Zaire. You know, Taekwon Lewis, of course, he 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 coached. So yeah, I mean that it, it's a good amount. Was he here? I guess he was probably here when they was he here when they drafted Quiddy and Dio? I'm trying to think how long Eberflus has been there. Yeah, because so, this is year three for Bradley, year four for Quiddy. Yeah, there you go. So, um, you just don't you don't have it to that degree, and you know, obviously, I go back to what I said earlier, and I guess it kind of applies here to this pod. There is such a trickle down effect from the defense in that your inability to, again, stop the run keeps you away from takeaways, keeps you away from. Controlling time and possession a little bit keeps you away from field position struggles and is just putting more on the volatile quarterback's plate. Yes. And, and, and that's unfair to him. Can Anthony Richardson be better? Certainly. Should he be better than he was on Sunday? Yes, I think so. I, I know there's going to be highs and lows, but I think you would like the lows to not look like Sunday looked mm-hmm. with the amount of turnovers um, and the amount of just turnover worthy plays. You know, you put two balls on the turf as well. I mean, that that's just too much to live with. But at the same time, like, you're supposed to be the veteran defense. You're supposed to have the tenured coordinator. Um, Malik Willis is not supposed to be this one that controls the game. And really, I felt like Green Bay was in full control. Mm-hmm. I don't know the final score maybe didn't indicate that, but that's what I felt. And I know there's some gray area involved in it, but that's how I look at Sunday there. So, um, to me, uh, there it's more to point to defensively than just that points allowed uh, because you do need to be the superior unit a, when you're facing Malik Wills, and B, with how your roster makeup is. Again, we're talking $150 million or whatever it was in money invested in that front seven. It's major draft picks invested into that group as well. Um, the expectation should be higher. Yeah, I mean, you've got Kenny Moore after the game saying we got our ass beat. Or was that Pittman? Which one said they got their ass kicked? I think it was Pittman. Yeah, it was yeah. Pittman. No, they got their ass beat. And, I was, and you look at the scoreboard, it's like, not really. But like even Joe Davis and Greg Olson were hitting on it coming back start the second half, it's like, you know, the Colts are only down two possessions, but it feels like they should be down 20. Right. And again, when you face quarterbacks like Willis, you've got to put them into turnover-worthy situations. And you didn't sniff that. How do you do that? You generate pressure. You you, well, you stop it. the run first, and then well, you generate pressure. Well, that too. Yeah. 
Michael is up next. I think it's time to at least start having real conversations about Anthony Richardson. The storyline is how little reps he's gotten at any level, and it certainly shows in how this would be a roller coaster of a year. But right now, in my eyes, he's just a bigger Malik Willis with more throwing power. I think it's way too early and we need to give him time. But at what point does this become unacceptable instead of he needs more reps? Matt Gay with a new injury now in the injury report. Oh, boy. Um, Gosh, he was out there with a helmet on at one point today. Uh, Let me tweet this out here. Real fast. Uh, uh, for those it. wondering what the injury report is, Matt Gay with a quadricep injury listed as a do not, uh, DMP did not participate along with Leatu Latu with a hip injury. Julian Blackman, Josh Downs, Kenny Moore, Rodney Thomas, all listed as full participants. Now, Josh Downs with the ankle injury, Julian Blackman with the shoulder injury, Kenny Moore the second with a thumb injury. And then Rodney Thomas also dealing with a shoulder injury. I'd say great looking injury report outside of that, right? Yeah, not, it's good to see Quiddy's not on the injury report. Yeah. After dealing with that hamstring soreness last week, and you said on Monday's podcast, or it might have been Wednesday's, uh, that you didn't see him at practice and he was pretty ginger when he was walking around. Right, but he ended up playing a ton. I actually thought his snap total was a little higher than I thought. Um, you know, as far as Michael's question is concerned, you have to commit to the reps or why else you draft them fourth overall. You know, I mean, you imagine bailing six games into Peyton Manning's career. If you bail six games into Peyton Manning's career, he's Ryan Leaf. Yeah. If you bail six games into Josh Allen's career, he's Josh Rosen. Yeah. So I, I just. And look at it with. um, Like to me, and I didn't think Sunday was like unacceptable to me. Like, I mean, yes, he played poorly, but you need more evidence. You have to string things together. Um, I know everybody wants the ready made and they want the CJ Stroud and. Et cetera, et cetera. But that's just not how every quarterback is made, frankly. That's not how every quarterback arc goes. Like, look at Sam Darnold right now and Baker Mayfield right now. Jared Goff. Like, all right. of these it, guys it, got look, written off. There's a line. I mean, you know, Daniel Jones getting a 60 something start on Sunday. It's like, sure. Um, and there is some gray area involved on that. But, Justin Fields is another one. Yeah. <laughs> but. You don't make the franchise investment of the fourth overall pick if you're going to say after six starts, we're done. And sure, there's a line in saying, hey, when you know, you have to act. Yes. Because that helps save your franchise and all of that. But to me, it is too early on Steichen. It's too early on Richardson to all of a sudden pull the plug on any sort of Richardson era. That to me is, yeah, I, I, I just think it's ludicrous, frankly, to go ahead and do that. Um, when you make that draft pick, you are foregoing an element of all chips in. That's what you're doing. And that's why I I make the argument probably more often than a lot of people of when Andrew Luck retired, you sh- that should have been a drop dead date right there. Mm-hmm. To say, let's go find the next one yeah, right away and not play the Band-Aid game because the Band-Aid game doesn't cover up the wounds forever. And you're seeing that. You're seeing that play out. You're, and that's exactly how it is. And obviously that draft immediately after Lux retirement, of course, produced a whole lot of quality quarterbacks. Four questions left. Andy would like to know, who is to blame more, Shane Steichen or Anthony Richardson? I feel like Shane is not putting Anthony in good situations, but also Anthony is missing some open throws. Game plan from the floor was great in the run game. Lots of misdirection. I feel like Shane needs to learn more of this than trying to make Anthony a drop-back passer in his first full season. Seems as if the Colts and Notre Dame's offense need to be centered around similar traits. Whoa! Although the Colts have a higher ceiling in their quarterback. Yeah, again, I've been surprised by Shane's offense so far. I have. And Eddie, you know what? So have I, by the way. The quote that I've thought of, the more this week I've thought about it, is that athletic survey of, can you run an offense that is effective yet keeps him healthy? Yeah. And like... Right now, it's keeping him healthy. To, right. To be effective, it's probably running him more. And, you know, when we've done the limit, not eliminate phrase all off season long, you know, I think I've kind of realized, hey, you can probably... There's risk involved, but like a six-ish design run, true carry RPO type of game... You can live with, and I think, I mean, I guess week one, he might have sniffed that. Week two, he certainly did not. 
I mean, it, it, it's been a little bit more like the preseason with the drop back stuff, which I guess is good for his growth, but certainly not good to try and help you win football games right now, which again, I mean, that just adds to the difficult balance. And that's why, I mean, you know, part of this too is like, when you're drafting four overall, I mean, I was certainly one that was clamoring to trade up because I just think you want to be in full control. And I know that obviously Carolina, it's turned into disaster for them. But if you can identify the right guy and you get him, mm-hmm. that's it. Point blank period. And then, you know, when you're the Colts and you're at the mercy of two teams above you leaving you what you have, there's warts on that. And the warts on Richardson are it takes patience, it takes development, it takes coaching. And support probably more so than any other first round pick that's ever been out there. So, yeah. um, are you going to be patient? And obviously, that rainbow that's way, way, way far away. Are you ever going to get there? I'm glad Isaiah brings this up. What's wrong with Michael Pittman Jr.? Yeah. He's played like a bum so far this season, catching four of eight and three of seven is not wide receiver one numbers. Adonai Mitchell and Alec Pierce seem to be creating more separation than him. I know he's facing the top corner corner most of the time but I still feel like he's underperforming we need Josh Downs back badly thanks for all your great work and I kind of illuminated on this a little bit earlier um, Isaiah and talking about him facing Derek Stingley and Jair Alexander two of the best man-to-man corners in the NFL and like to go back to this whole Shane Steichen conversation I feel like Steichen hasn't really tried to scheme things up to get him open or to try to get him the ball, really, for the most part. Yeah, you often see like some screens to Pittman mm-hmm. to kind of get him involved as well. Um, I don't think we've seen that. Um, I think in general, from a route tree standpoint, I haven't seen a whole lot of separation from him as some of the other guys. Now, again, to your point, Eddie, how much of that is due to the corners you've faced so far? Um, but yeah, right now, I think it's very fair to say he is not at all look like a true number one. I know we get into different levels of the number one and all of that. Um, cause you know, the targets, I mean, he's living at about a 50% target rate and he is too much of an underneath receiver to live at a 50% target rate. Mm-hmm. If he was Pierce or Tyreek and, you know, vertical, vertical, vertical and second and third level shots, T you, Higgins, you can live with some of that smaller percentage, but that's not Pittman. You know, it, it people have called him a glorified tight end and I get why people say that, uh, he, he has got to be better. He does fall on the, uh, the reliables category that I go back to on Monday of just disappointment so far. Could there just be a changing of the guard between him to Pierce right now while Anthony's getting acclimated that he feels more comfortable, more confident getting the ball to Alec Pierce than Michael Pittman? Yeah, it, yeah. It, changing of the guard to me is a big phrase, so I'm not ready to go there, but I hear you out. Two questions. Let's, let's try to hammer these out real quick. Alex, given the small sample size, who is the best comp for Anthony Richardson? Can we past or present? He reminds me so much of a young... Donovan McNabb, athleticism, great deep ball, and absolutely no touch on short to medium throws. Josh Allen, keep on coming back to it. If you want to feel good about yourself, go back and watch Josh Allen's rookie season, Colts fans. And really, it kind of ate into year two as well. Yeah, they got Stephon Diggs, and next thing you know, it helped him out immensely. Final yeah. question is from Tanner. Cam Newton w- would be the one, the other one. Yeah, you know, that's a and, good point. And, and Cam... You know, that's one that Richardson certainly would, would agree with. But yeah, go back. Yeah. If you want to feel good, Josh Allen. But again, you go back to Wyoming with Josh Allen. Did his dudes just suck? Was that the issue? You mm-hmm. know, with Richardson, you know, people would say, well, well, Florida, he's at Florida. That means those dudes shouldn't suck. But then it's like, wait, have you watched Florida play football lately? Mm-hmm. They might lose to Wyoming. So I don't know. Tanner would like to know when it will be a good time to consider tearing it all down and rebuilding. I kind of chuckle at the question and then start to wonder if slash when we get a new general manager, wouldn't he want his guys? Don't want to think too far in the future, but Arch Manning would look good in a Colts uniform. Now that I think about this Matt Gay quad thing, I do remember looking over in the locker room today and Spencer Schrader was like very intensely like getting ready for practice. I'm like, damn, that dude's really working for someone that's not going to kick. Well, I guess now it kind of makes sense now that I think about it. So are we saying it's a quadricep injury and why he keeps pulling the ball left? Oh, man, I don't know. It's just so stressful. Um, okay, uh, Tanner, it's a big statement. Yeah. It, what does that say about Richardson? What does that say about Steichen, your core older guys? It, 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 obviously Ballard. Yeah, I, I just, no. Um, I, I know he chuckles at the question and all of that, but there are so many ramifications off of that. 
mm-hmm. off of Jim Irsay making that sort of decision. I mean, think about the embarrassment level it took in 2022 for him to go there. And he didn't fully go there. Yeah. You know, he kept Ballard. So, you know, 2022 was, I would say, your most embarrassing year in 30 seasons. So, uh, that's quite the level. Um, yeah, I mean, it would take historical proportions of that to reach there. And I, I'm not ready to say that this team is going there yet. And, you know, you got to remember, Ursay has an ownership where, you know, he he might, who knows with Ursay, but he might point to say, hey, 3-13, and Peyton's first year. Mm-hmm. And I know that would piss off a whole lot of people, but he would point to that. All right, birthday boy. Um, your Colts, Bears prediction, you're 1-1, one one, I'm 1-1. One one. Max Bowen is 0-2. and two. I will go Colts 19, Bears 9. 20 to 16. Aro Santos kicks a lot of field goals. Colts. Um, ugly. Coach Yost, you blitz all night. Yeah, you have to. You have to. I mean, you have to make Caleb Williams uncomfortable. And again, the scar tissue's there. Make sure he sees that. Make sure he feels that early on. Got to go tempo. Um, that It's going to be a weird environment on Sunday. It's going to be weird. Mm-hmm. You know, the Colts get in a little bit of a hole. They're going to be in their own building being like, wait a minute, are they yelling on third down when the offense is out there? Like, It's just, it's awkward. I mean, the Steelers have had this effect on the Colts before. And they'll see Pittsburgh next week. But it's just weird when you get into these, like, home games where all these road fans are there. So uh, shut them up. Stay away from that. Get out to a quick start. Um, the Colts look to be decently healthy in the non-Buckner category. Yeah. Um, Josh Downs, of course, coming back. So, yeah, 2016 Colts. He's Eddie Garrison. I'm Kevin Bowen. Everybody have a great week.